So let me give you the Cliff's Notes version of this. If I do this right, we'll get through the slides uh, relatively quickly because I'd like to just have time for discussion if we, if we can do that. I think a lot of this, uh, I really want to kind of gear this to the questions that you have. Um, but I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes of the talk. Um, so if you get paged or something and have to leave, um, here's the summary of everything I'm going to say. It really comes down to, to four things. Um, one, obesity is the new tobacco. Uh, you know, for, I, I grew up in, in oncology um, uh, seeing tobacco as the object of all of our efforts. Obesity is the new tobacco. Second, we don't understand obesity as well as we, as we understand tobacco. We know much less about obesity cessation, if that's a term, than we know about tobacco cessation. And in general, we don't talk about it. It's just harder to talk about it. And, and to be absolutely honest, um, a large percentage of us, myself included, have spent a good part of my adult life getting on a scale and going, what am I doing? So part of it is when we struggle with this stuff, and so many of us do, how do we talk to other people about it? Um, the obesity uh, educational gap is enormous, and I have some data that I'm going to show you about that. And finally, um, there's an economics to obesity that doesn't exist in tobacco. We save money if we can stop smoking but it costs more money to eat a healthy diet. And that's just one of the cruelties of our culture. Um, I, there are some, uh, these are some questions I put together when I uh, do this um, uh, talk, and I'll go through them really quickly. It's not designed really to be a quiz. What's the relationship of obesity and uh, malnutrition? Just going through these, we have a tendency, or a lot of people have a tendency, to think obesity is too much, malnutrition is too little. Malnutrition is, is pictures of kids uh, starving in third world countries. Uh, um, uh, what we don't recognize is that obesity is a form of malnutrition and does represent an independent and important medical disorder to understand. What percentage of states uh, are, are at least half the population over, overweight? I'm going to show you the slide for that, but you know, um, it's no surprise that it's now 100%. In Santa Barbara, what's most associated with poor health? This is really interesting data because it comes from the cottage health needs assessment for our community. You can look at all these things and think all these things are valid. What's really interesting is that the factor that came out in the cottage health needs assessment was lack of a high school diploma. And we're going to look at the fact that education is a huge component of, uh, and economics, the economics associated with lack of education become a huge component in nutrition. And finally, um, I'm involved a lot in uh, work on our West Side community. And in, uh, for those of you who, uh, who know the West Side and know Harding School, more than four out of five kids there qualify for uh, free or reduced lunch, um, uh, free or reduced uh, cost meals. Here's a, one of my favorite slides. I always find a way to kind of put this in there, even if it doesn't really belong. This is actually from the New England Journal of Medicine, so it's, it's real. On the uh, vertical column is the, the, the y-axis is the um, Nobel laureates per 10 million population. In other words, looking at different countries, correcting for country size. How many Nobel Prizes have their scientists won? And then on the x-axis, to all our delight, is the median consumption of chocolate. And you can see with a p-value of less than 0 0.0001, there is a great correlation between the median consumption of chocolate and winning a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I want you to know I have copies of this that are suitable for framing. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, 
on a serious note, this is the teaching slide that we use for correlation without causation. There is a correlation between the medium consumption of chocolate to all our disappointment. Probably there's no causative factor there, uh, although we certainly can try. Um, this is uh, consumption of chocolate is simply a surrogate for median income. How much dispensable income does a country have to spend on its educational system and scientific research? And, and what happens, this is really an introduction to the theme of economics. This is not directly about obesity, but it's really important to understand. This looks at men age 50 and what percentage of them survive to age 85 and divides that population according to income. And what's absolutely clear, and it goes the, the, the blue to the light blue, or that, that, that transition is the lowest fifth economically to the highest fifth economically. And you can see that the likelihood of surviving to age 85 is simply related to how rich you are. And if you look at the two lowest groups, because one group of slides, and you can take a look at this later when, you know, if you look at the packet and look at the slide, because it may take a minute to put this together. But when you look at the 1930 cohort and the 1960 cohort, and you look at the bottom two groups, the lowest 40% financially, those groups made almost no progress in that 30-year period, notwithstanding the huge progress in medicine, those two groups make almost no progress in the percentage that live to age 85. All of the medical advances between 1930 and 1960 appear to have inured to the benefit of people who had enough money to take advantage of them. Here's the uh, trends in overweight prevalence. Uh, going back to 1992, the most recent data here is 2010. This goes to that question I asked, what percentage of states, uh, in what percentage of, of states, or at least uh, half the population overweight, and you can see now that the country is entirely uh, red. So the, the, the trends are, are, are great, and so we've, we've got to look both at trends and at economics, and we're try, I want to, in, the, in the succeeding slides, I want to try to sort some of that out. Um, these are obesity trends. This is the same thing. This is obesity trends by, by birth cohort, and at the bottom, you're looking at um, the older population born between 1926 and 1935. And then that goes up. Uh, each succeeding line is a younger and younger generation. And you can see that each succeeding generation climbs a little bit higher on this, um, on this, on this chart, looking at the percentage of population that's, um, that's obese. What's really frightening is you look at that small blue line which is the cohort born between 86 and 95, and you see at some point almost 20% of those kids are obese. This is uh, the slide that's relevant to us. We're involved in cancer medicine. Um, the number of cancers in which there is a component of risk that is nutritional is uh, greater than I think our education, our medical education generally prepares us for understanding. It's extraordinarily important in breast and colon cancer, but it's also important in a number of other uh, number of diseases. Um, and, and the consequences in terms of outcome um, are, you know, are, are tragic. This is simply, um, this is risk of dying of cancer. And, uh, uh, and particularly for for, uh, for women, um, this is a um, huge risk factor uh, that uh, creates uh, adverse outcomes. In Santa Barbara County, it's, you know, this is just uh, local data to see how it plays out in, in our county. Um, I can't help but 
uh, add that uh, we've got three times as many fast food restaurants as we have produce vendors. But in addition to which, if you walk through uh, neighborhoods, and I'm, and I'm only going to talk about the west side because it's an area in which I personally have just in, in, uh, have been uh, most active in, uh, in, in trying to help with population health. Uh, not only is there proliferation, proliferation of fast food, but there are many more liquor stores than there are sources of fresh produce. This is the educational gap. This is, a, this is data published actually just last week by the American Society of Clinical Oncology that about a third of Americans in this study saw a relationship uh, between obesity and cancer. Uh, I will say, uh, in the, I didn't put this data in the slide, but we've gotten to the point where about 80% of people recognize the connection between tobacco and cancer. So uh, uh, we, you know, this is illustrative of how far we have to go. By the way, um, um, as much as there's encouraging news about chocolate, there's discouraging news about alcohol, and there is uh, no uh, question that there's a relationship, particularly in breast cancer, between excessive alcohol intake and development of cancer. It's astounding to me that in this study, only 25% of those uh, uh, people who participated in the study saw a relationship between lack of exercise and, and risk for malignancy. Um, this is some of the data that we deal with in the uh, clinic um, in our uh, overweight population. We, you know, prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men, but, what's, but what seems to be a factor in obesity is the development of more biologically aggressive uh, cancers and presentation with more advanced disease. Uh, the data in, in breast cancer, and I'll show you some other data, is just really daunting. And, and so, in, I've, you know, I think the, the, tam, the story that Tammy told is, is, is right. And there are some times where if I have patients who are reluctant to take hormonal therapy for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which is, which given its side effects is quite understandable. The fact of the matter is I'm ready to make the trade off of, okay, don't take the pill, but please change your lifestyle because I think actually it may be uh, 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 just as important. And, and certainly uh, uh, it will not only impact their risk for recurrent breast cancer, uh, but uh, I really worry, as is in Tammy's story, that we're gonna fix breast cancer only to allow our patients to die prematurely of heart disease. Um, this is, uh, you know, I don't think we know enough about adolescent obesity, and this is a, a slide that looks at the correlation between adolescent obesity and uh, increased risk for colon cancer. You have to just kind of draw a line vertically from uh, age, uh, from 40 years of follow-up, and you just kind of look at the difference between the highest curve and the lowest curve to know that something bad is going on. If I, I, I know that if I spent a lot of time on this slide, uh, everybody would suddenly start to walk out and it, look for coffee. So I, <laughs> in selfish, selfishly, I'm gonna just kind of gloss over it. But it's, you know, the, the take home message of these pathway slides, and there's lots of them, here's one, here's another. The, there's just a lot of signaling going on between, uh, between um, uh, fat cells and, uh, and uh, the precursors of, of molecular stimulation. Here's really the, the simple, you know, here's the simple take home message. If we take a fit person and put 30 pounds of weights around their waist and have them walk around with 30 pounds of weights, in six months we're just gonna have, we may have a 
kind of fatigued, but we're going to have a more fit version of the person we looked at six months ago. But if you take that fit 30-year-old patient and then have them, pick the fit patient and then have them gain 30 pounds, we just inherently know that that's different. This is not 30 pounds of inert substance. These, these fat cells do bad things. And when we look at slides like this that are never quite understandable, the fact of the matter is they're just trying to explain the difference between inert weight and something that actually is a bad actor in our bodies. Here's some of the recurrence data for breast cancer. Um, uh, th these are a series of curves looking at recurrences that go up on the y-axis and follow up time in years divided by, by cohorts according to body mass index. And the, you know, the take-home message is there with each succeeding increase in body mass index, we see a higher percentage of uh, risk of recurrence. By the way, we, most all of our data now is based on body mass index. There are new algorithms that are being developed. One of them is body volume index. Body volume index tries to look at actual distribution uh, on our bodies of, of where that, that fat is. It's much more complicated to calculate. You have to kind of take pictures of profiles of yourself and, and put it into an algorithm. Body mass index is to a first approximation, it's easier, easier, us, easier for us to use. It simply is an opportunity to correct weight for height. And so that's why so many of these slides use BMI. Um, this, is a, this is data from a study presented uh, at, the, uh, at the San Antonio breast cancer meetings by Rowan Chalowski, who some of you guys uh, know, who's based in LA and, and did so much good work with the Women's Health Initiative. And this was uh, looking at women with early stage estrogen, interesting estrogen receptor negative breast cancer with looking at the impact of dietary intervention, which at the time focused on fat. And we know that in some respects now we might not have done the study the same way, but the fact of the matter is um, they saw differences in curves. And, and the, uh, one of these um, curves is the intervention group, which is the pink curve at the, uh, at the, at the top, and the, the control group was the blue curve, and this simply looks at the likelihood of survival over years of follow-up. And, you know, I think that, I, so what it basically tells us is that uh, it's never too late we have the opportunity when we see our patients to say, okay, you've struggled with this for years, it's not too late if we can help you now to make a difference uh, in, uh, in your life. There are guidelines now. Um, I think it's kind of a weird picture, but. Uh, I don't know. Somebody got paid a lot of money, I think, to design this. <laughs> I, I think we could have done a better job, but the fact of the matter is American Society of Clinical Oncology does have uh, guidelines for, um, uh, for providers. There's actually now a, a certification that you can get. There's an American Board of Obesity Medicine that um, that provides certification in expertise in managing obesity. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of those groups, it succumbed to be, being a very expensive uh, process. Somehow, we within our own profession, we've got to find a way to, to make uh, knowledge and certification more financially accessible. Uh, so the question is, what do I tell patients? And a couple of years ago, we had Michael Pollan here, and um, I don't, you know, he's really a professor of journalism, but you can't help but love his aphorisms. Um, don't eat anything your great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. Um, uh, wow, I think that um, uh, don't buy food where you, where you buy gas, I think is. <laughs> 
You know, my, uh, my wife and I had the privilege of being in um, Namibia this year. We, we uh, took our daughter and her fiance and we uh, rented an SUV and drove around um, Atosha Park. That decision to do this on our own without a guide is a separate lecture in. <laughs> At one point in the trip, we realized that um, uh, we were going to need to get gas, and we uh, found out that the nearest gas station was 110 kilometers. So we, you know, we got in the car and we road tripped to the gas station. And so there are miles and miles and miles of just wilderness and animals. I mean, it's just an extraordinary part of the world with just extraordinary people who live there. It was a wonderful trip. But we got to this, finally, you know, in the horizon, we actually see a building and we show up in this, in this town in Namibia. And there are like three buildings in the town, one of which is a gas station. But here in rural Namibia, what do you have with a gas station? Of course, you have a mini mart behind it. <laughs> and we go in the mini mart, and what do we see but rows and rows of junk food? Rural Namibia, and there it is, packaged junk food. We have exported all of our nutritional faults. We have done such a good job. And actually, I didn't put the slide in here, but if you, you, know, if you go hark back to that slide of the United States and, and the escalating weights of, of our population in the country, we are doing an extraordinary job around the world of exporting obesity because we're looking at those trends in third world countries that have uh, no business uh, and, and should have no need to eat um, Twinkies. Um, so I wanna, um, uh, I'm gonna show one, I think we're, we're, we're okay for time. I'm gonna show uh, one video. I wanna, by the way, in the, in the back, I want a shout out to Derek Olson, who's uh, just a, a brilliant, uh, videographer and who really deserves a lot of credit for this video. But this is a video that we uh, made uh, with the help of um, my friends at Cottage, at Cottage Health. This is a video we made uh, looking at population health uh, here in Santa Barbara on the west side. And um, I want to take a look at that because there are some important nutritional messages and then we can come back. It's about seven something minutes long, I think. And, and then we can come back and take some questions as time allows. I'm Fred Cass and I'm here at the Mitchell Terrena Street Bridge. It's really the perfect spot to tell a really interesting and compelling story about our neighborhoods and about the challenges of population health in Santa Barbara. At the north end of our bridge are Castillo and Bass Streets. Cottage Hospital is eight pretty short blocks away, but for our narrative, we're going to walk the other way. We're going to walk towards St. Andrew's Street in the heart of Santa Barbara's west side. The west side has an amazingly rich history. I hope sometime that there's more time to tell its story. But right now it's important to emphasize the poverty that burdens these neighborhoods that lie between 101 and the ocean. According to federal census data, about a quarter of the population on the west side live below the federal poverty line. And this doesn't take into account the challenges of living in some places expensive as Santa Barbara. The health implications of poverty are significant. The overall death rate in Santa Barbara County in 2010 was 590 per 100,000 people. In high poverty areas like the West Side, it was over 750 per 100,000 people. One issue on the West Side is the relative dearth of health centers, given the depth of the need of this community. The dots represent health and human services locations. Most of the resources, as you can see, are on the other side of Highway 101. So our first stop will be the West Side Neighborhood Clinic on Mitchell Terrena, right by San Andre. Our population tends to be a population that 
requires a little extra care um, because our patient population tends to have other challenges other than only their medical care. We have a large number of people who live at 200% or below the poverty level and those folks uh, struggle to find access to health care. They have financial challenges, they have social challenges, they have educational challenges, language challenges. All of those things require a little extra. So the partnership that has been forged over the last uh, two years with Cottage Health has been incredibly important as we together focus on this whole idea of population health management. Case management is going to turn out to be the next big issue for us as we get people into the system and help them navigate the system. One of the big issues that we have, particularly with our patients who have behavioral health problems, is being able to get them to their appointments. I have a patient that I've just been dealing with uh, just in the last few minutes who is schizophrenic. He's got a mass in his neck. There's a, an MRI that we just finished getting. Shows that he may very well have a lymphoma. And he has just told our outreach person he does not want to talk to any of us at all. He'll come see us if he feels sick. I've had a number of patients end up with end-stage cancers and die because they didn't want to come in due to the expense. So that's changed quite a lot because of the California covered care and um, increased enrollment in Medi-Cal, but we still see that. Now let's head further down the street to the Harding School. Here's some quick data on Harding School. There are about 500 students in the school. The population is overwhelmingly Latino. Three quarters are English learners, and more than four out of five qualify for free or reduced cost meals programs. Most of our students speak English. Their uh, families, however, probably about 50% are monolingual Spanish speakers. We have a fantastic parent population. A lot of parents that are deeply concerned and proactive and, um, and come to have monthly meetings. And I put it to them, you know, if you could shoot for the moon, what is it that you would like? They started with the very concrete and, and discussed in nutrition classes and how to cook traditionally using better ingredients and how to shop for that. And we were talking about the stress of just daily life and how much stress can be on a child when there's an argument at home or when there's work-related stress, it's brought down to the children. You know, we have kids that are homeless here and uh, we have a wide range of needs here. Probably your best bet is to come and talk to the community. We know that nutrition and obesity are national problems. We've just been shopping at Foodland. Uh, I spent about $13, about half of which uh, bought um, tortillas and beans, about half of which bought some uh, fresh vegetables. I wanted to just to illustrate the dilemma facing parents in the uh, west side. It's not that they can't buy fresh foods, uh, but uh, the value of fresh foods, as Michael Pollan points out, is that they rot, and while that makes them more nutritious, it also makes them a much riskier investment. So for families that have very little to spend, they can spend six and a half dollars on fresh vegetables, not knowing if in fact they're going to all be eaten before they go bad, or they can spend money on tortillas and beans knowing that um, the likelihood of of losing their value is very small. Really, this is an issue of providing more nutritional assistance and more nutritional education, because the real culprit on the west side is actually none of these. It's really this. It's this and soda. And that's really what dominates nutrition for a lot of kids in our west side community. We end our tour at the West Side Boys and Girls Club, where there's a very special nutrition program that deserves highlighting. 97% of the kids that come to our club, our facility, are on free or reduced lunch, and you run into the weekend, there's no school. A lot of these kids don't eat. This food truck here is feeding close to 200 people a night, dinner, every single night. Um, these are families who really need the food service. They're appreciative. And what it's done for us is we guarantee that our kids are going to have a healthy meal at night, and these are good meals. What a lot of people are surprised by is how many children in this city with this kind of wealth are going to bed hungry. There's a lot of them. And if it wasn't for partnerships with the school district, 
and people like Dave Cash and Nancy Weiss, our kids would be going to bed hungry. And I just, I can't thank them enough. Yeah, that was eye-opening for me, and it's kind of uh, changed a little bit of the direction of my own professional life, but I think that it's, it's motivated me to just be as involved in these community issues. And I, of course, I thank again the, the folks at uh, Cottage that uh, helped me prepare this in preparation for a um, Cottage Health Board retreat. Anyway, that ends the prepared part of my, um, my presentation. If we, if we have some time, I'd have to be happy to encourage you to ask questions or have your own discussion. I'm just curious. Um, I have been through a weight loss journey, and um, I'm 58 years old. I've lost 150 pounds. Um, but, and I didn't want that. I didn't want, I didn't want to pause for that because I was overweight for 25 years. So. Um, for me, what flipped the switch was a spiritual connection. And um, so I'm just wondering how, if you use that in your practice at all, if that's something that, um, because for me, I'd always, you know, gone to church, believe in God and all that stuff, but I never equated my belief in God or my belief in Jesus to the connection with respecting my body and taking care of myself that yeah. this was, you know, this is like something that was a gift. and by being overweight, I was abusing my gift. And so that's kind of like what did it for me. And so I, I know everybody's got different reasons for losing weight or for being healthy. Sometimes it's for their children or their family, but um, that's what did it for me. So I'm just wondering if you use that in your yeah. practice. Yeah, so thank you. So first of all, first of all, thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, it's one of the, one of the, you know, the challenges of, of, of of talking about this is just the fact that these, you know, this this goes to very personal stories, and um, and 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 how do we, how, you know, I just seizing on just listening to your story. How do we talk about this and be sensitive to the fact that this is extremely personal for uh, for all of us? And on the one hand, I want to be um, uh, frank about the data because it's really important for us to medically understand it. On the other hand, uh, we want to em em embrace ourselves and our, and our colleagues and our patients uh, so that we feel um, supported. The, the you know, spiritual um, kind of a, uh, imperative is that we are charged to be uh, stewards of our own bodies. And, 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 but for whether it's a, and, and, you know, I think that, that I, I, you know, I personally take that to heart, but, but I think everybody comes from a different place. Everybody has a, um, a different story. Uh, for those of us who have, who have struggled with our weight, no one gave us a form early in life that said, hey, check what you'd like to be. And we just decided, okay, I'll check the box that says, I'll have a BMI of 30 and I'll struggle with my weight for the rest of my life. So, I mean, no one, no one checked that box on that form and, and we don't get to pick our parents. Um, so I, I think that uh, for everybody that where that source of strength is or how we make that transition, is going to be different. One of the things I, one of the things that's motivated me to be involved in this as an oncologist is not only because there's so much compelling data about obesity and, and outcomes in cancer, but because uh, becoming diagnosed with cancer becomes such a fundamental teachable moment. There's a, there's a, there's an op when we get hit by a bus. As traumatic as that is, it's an invitation to reboot. And there are it just those, those kinds of traumatic events in our lives force us to stop and take stock and think about what's important and, and search for, for redirection. And I think one of the opportunities in, in cancer medicine is that, um, is that we're all kind of struck by the opportunity to look inside, see where our 
strengths are, see where our family strengths are, and, and, and look for a new direction forward. Yes. Uh, just to share a little bit of something that our hospital did, we're down in Salinas Valley, and um, we partnered with a local YMCA for people after a community needs assessment, um, mostly on the for uh, pre-diabetics to kind of work through that. But also, uh, one of the other things we did was implement um, produce dollars. We have a um, farmer's market at our hospital from May through October. So depending on what your need is, they also gave them produce dollars to spend at the market so that they could have those better choices. So. Those are some of the things that we implemented that maybe others may be yeah. able to use as well. Yeah, that's a great that's a great story. I think and the uh, the there are uh, I think one of the the take home messages of your story, besides the fact that it's a great description of a great comprehensive program that you have at your hospital, is the concept of partnerships. Um, and we we have. In some respects, in the nonprofit world, uh, not uniformly, but we have a, a tradition of being, um, we have our nonprofit, we have uh, our little charge in the world, um, no one else does it but us, and we have our fundraiser to fund our nonprofit to do this thing. And I think that model for nonprofits is probably not sustainable. And in the current era, what we're all searching for, who those of us who are involved in the nonprofit world, is, to, is the concept of collective impact. And your story is a great example of you have the hospital, you have the YMCA, you have other partners, and you bring those partners together, and there's a real collective impact. And, 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 and challenges like nutrition, and especially when we deal with a diverse, very diverse uh, 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 population of people, um, the concept of having uh, partners in this effort is, um, uh, is, is, is really a, you know, just a really important fundamental piece to this, and I think your story is a great example of that. I think we have time for one more. Um, oh, it's kind of two parts. So a, oh. I just was wondering about sugar, sugar in particular. Sugar? Yes. And its relationship to, you know. To, well, yeah, this is the concept of sugar. Sugar feeds cancer. There's actually uh, data published this week on the relationship between uh, sugar and cell turnover. I would caution you that it was done in yeast. And while that's important data, there's a lot of stuff in the evolutionary chain between us and yeast. Um, The other thing is, I think that uh, going back to your question, is there, a, you know, is there a spiritual component of this? Uh, I, I tell patients that um, they can eat the sugar that God put in the world, and I have confidence that it's okay. What they need to avoid is the sugar that we put in the world, and that I have real doubts about. So if it's in a box and it's sweet, probably you should take it off your list. But please, when you go to the farmer's market and someone hands you some beautiful fresh fruit grown by one of our local growers, please leave there the sugar feeds cancer, leave that at home. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, that, yeah, that, that's, I think, the answer. Well, at least that's my answer. I don't know if it's the answer, but it's my answer. So listen, thank you so much for being involved. In this.